My name is Laura Palacios, content marketing specialist in the public affairs team at the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. I got fans, thanks y'all. Uh, my pronouns are she, hers, and ella. I identify as Latinx, Hispanic, Mexican American, Chicana, Latine, Latina, Tejana, and I welcome any new identity my community comes up with, because we are innovators. I wanted to create a space to honor and respect the indigenous peoples whose land we stand on. In recent years, these nations have included the Missouri, Oto, Kansa, Osage, Shawnee, and Delaware. Today, I welcome us all to pay our respect to all indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, for their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Native American diaspora. So, welcome to the Kaufman Foundation in your community space within our conference center. The Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation is focused on creating more opportunities and stronger communities to help people achieve financial stability, upward mobility, and economic prosperity, regardless of race, gender, or geography. I'm excited for you to hear from this panel on rewriting zero sum, strengthening entrepreneurship in America. And I want to big, uh, give a big thank you to the Kansas City Business Journal for co-hosting with us. Uh, if you are in the Kansas, if you're in the room from the Kansas City Business Journal, put your little hands up, and everyone, let's do a, a round of applause. So with that, I want to go ahead and hand it over to. Mr. Carmona, uh, want to get us started? Cool. Well, really great to see everybody here today, and a few I know, and a few I hope to get to know a little bit better later. But my name is Michael Carmona. I'm the senior director with KC SourceLink. Have several folks from my team here today, so really excited. Um, won't talk too much about why we're here today, but keep that brief, and then we'll hear a little bit more of, from our panelists and what they do, and really why they're here today. So. I think when we talk about entrepreneurship and small business, um, a lot of what we really look at is the individual and the purpose for why they want to start or grow a business. And a lot of times, it's not just to create jobs. It's not just to, you know, do this or do that, but it's really a, a bigger sense. And what we found through a lot of our work, especially in the last couple of years with PPP and a lot of the injustices that occurred and the challenges that we had since George Floyd and, and a lot of those issues is that a lot of the things that, that several of us, I think, here know about um, really came to light. And a lot of this around not having access to different opportunities and a lot of the systemic challenges that helped to put a lot of us to where we're at today. So when we talk about entrepreneurship, and the work that Kaufman has been doing, it's really great to see a, you know, the, the, the new plan in place to really talk about ways to be intentional and in being inclusive to make sure that all folks who want to start and grow business have those opportunities. So that's why we're here today and we'll talk about some of the themes of that new business plan that um, hopefully you all have had a chance to read. If not, we'll get a chance to read as uh, you, you leave here today, follow up. Um, but we're going to hear a little bit more from our folks uh, and talk a little bit about who you are, what you represent, a little bit about your history. And I think we can get started from there. Ruben, do we want to start with you? Yeah, happy to kick it off. Uh, Ruben Alonzo, CEO of Altcap. We're a community development financial institution, or a CDFI. And maybe just by a show of hands, how many people have heard of a CDFI or work with a CDFI? Great, um, that's actually more than I, than I expect to see, so I guess we're, we're doing our work <laughs> um, in terms of just creating more awareness about CDFI. So CDFIs are very specialized financial institutions. Um, they exist essentially to bring capital to communities, um, to entrepreneurs that fall out of the financial mainstream. And that's really kind of our mission, our purpose in Kansas City and, and beyond now, 
Um, we've, we've grown um, beyond just the Kansas City Metro. But uh, what we do is really find gaps um, in the capital markets uh, that we can fill in terms of getting a loan to an entrepreneur to start a business or grow their business or providing kind of catalytic capital to a community uh, that has been disinvested or underinvested. So um, we actually started out um, initially as a very kind of specialized tax credit financing institution um, using tax credits to finance catalytic real estate development projects and um, uh, operating businesses, but have recently been very focused on small business lending and micro lending, really trying to get capital to, to those entrepreneurs that, that need it the most. So um, accessibility is synonymous to us um, with inclusivity. So uh, the more we can make capital accessible uh, to entrepreneurs, uh, the more inclusive uh, of an economy we can create uh, for everybody. So that's a little bit about AltCap. Jackie. Hi. Um, my name is Jackie Nguyen. I am the owner of Cafe Cafe. It is a Vietnamese coffee shop in Kansas City, the first and only. Um, we started off as a mobile cart in town for about a year. And uh, about three months ago, I just opened our first brick and mortar. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and it is in Columbus Park. Um, and Cafe Cafe is more than a coffee shop. We are really trying to amplify the Asian and the Asian American narrative here in the Kansas City area um, and also help other small businesses that are from marginalized communities. And so 100% of our employees are from marginalized communities, whether that's queer, women, Asian, artists. Um, that's something that we really want to use our coffee shop, our platform for. Um, but eventually, my goal is to be able to kind of open um, the the opportunities up for Asians in Kansas City. So that's who I am. Thank you. My name is Samuel Morris, and I'm the small business advocate and policies coordinator for the city of Kansas City, Missouri, um, also known as KC BizCare. Um, so we're actually located on the first floor of City Hall, and our office exists to provide technical assistance to folks starting or growing their business and going through the regulatory requirements the many regulatory requirements, right, that are, that are required to start a business, whether that's federal, state, or city. Um, so a, a, a brief history about our office, right, is, is that in 2009, it was started um, on council ordinance, and it took a process that historically took entrepreneurs two to three months, made it mobile friendly, um, and now folks can obtain the paperwork that's necessary most times for their business license in an hour or less. There's still a lot of work to be done because while that paperwork exists, we also know that there are institutional barriers, right? We know that sometimes folks get permits and other folks get permits, and these folks don't get permits, and we wonder why. Um, so, so we're taking a long, hard look at ourselves in the mirror as a city institution, as the regulatory institution, to one, keep upholding, right, that standard for Kansas Cityans to go to a business, to know that it's good, to know that it's trustworthy, to know that they're tax responsible, to know that you're safe to consume a cup of coffee there. But also, we wanna make sure that that process is equitable. We wanna make sure that that process, since we're asking folks to do it, is easy. We wanna make sure that that process satisfies the city requirement, but is also friendly. Like it's 2022, I don't need to notarize something and put it in the mail. I mean, I don't think I should, right? But that's why our office exists, is to provide assistance. And as we've been providing assistance, as we've been saying, and the analogy that I like to use that all of us are very you know, much aware of here in Kansas City, especially this time of year, is, is potholes in the street. All right, so we've been helping people get through this process by saying, hey, go turn left on this street, but make it a wide left, or else you're going to have to get a new ball joint, right? <laughs> that's, that's what we realize in Kansas City. But what we'd like to do while we've been providing that assistance, we'd like to repave the street. Um, so, so that's where I, our office exists and why I'm glad to be here. And that was a really good analogy, too. That's great. So we're going to try to use that, too. India, do you want to go next? Well, good evening. My name is India Wells-Carter. I'm the owner of Fresh Factory KC. We are a selfie studio and event space in Zona Rosa. Um, I like to say we like to play, party, and photograph. So we offer a ticketed hourly experience where you can come and take as many selfies or create as many TikToks as you wish. We also host private events and birthdays and celebrations and happy hours. And then we love to take our services on the go with our mobile selfie installations. Um, so 
whether that's at your community event or at your office space, we bring the fun to you. Um, proud Kansas City native, creative, um, and I would say career shifter as well prior to entrepreneurship. I was right here in this educational nonprofit space, but happy to now have another title as entrepreneur here in Kansas City and starting a business. So thank you all. All right. So, um, you know, one of the things that's really great, and I did my homework and, and read the report before before starting this, so I've got a few numbers to share. But really, one of the things that we think about, especially about entrepreneurship, regardless of the type of business that we're wanting to start, um, there's a lot around opportunity, right? So we start our business for certain opportunities. And what's really nice about the report that Kaufman put together is that uh, a lot of what I think we know that's presented there is that if you're black, you're brown, you're a woman, a lot of times those opportunities are a lot harder to get to. And what's really great about the report and that we're gonna be able to learn about today, but some of the work that our folks have been doing, some of the activities that they've done, the experiences that they've faced, is that there are ways to work through those challenges to eliminate barriers and to make entrepreneurship more accessible to more people. So one of the things that really stood out, and we'll ask Ruben a, a question about some of the work that he's doing around access to capital, but what was really interesting in the report is that they talk about median household income. And the median household income of a black family is right now at $17,000. And Latino families are very similar. So when you talk about looking for a loan or looking for some type of investment and you yourself don't have that funding to support yourself, that collateral that banks and other institutions are looking for, you're already set up to not have that opportunity. So we have groups like Rubens that are able to provide that alternative capital. So Ruben, can you share a little bit more about how your space works and some stories and Jackie, we know that you've gone through that a bit, so we'll go to you next, but do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, um, and, and happy to kind of talk about how we're addressing that as well, but um, I think to start off, it's an unfortunate fact that it still matters who you are or where you live uh, in terms of accessing kind of traditional capital, and that's kind of the, the um, access to capital issue that, that we're trying to help a lot of entrepreneurs overcome. So. Um, for us, as a CDFI, as a kind of mission impact driven lender, um, we're trying to remove barriers um, to accessing that capital. And it's not just, you know, um, banks work in a, you know, highly regulated environment, but there's also kind of a historical context here, which you alluded to, is like this, this um, disparity in wealth um, that exists. And when you're talking about kind of asset based lending, you know, to go get a loan, a bank's essentially gonna look for something to secure that loan with, and it's gonna be either your house or some sort of personal or business asset. And if you don't have that, you know, you're already kind of behind the eight ball. And that, that is a big issue in terms of access to capital, whether you're a startup uh, or even established business. So uh, we try to kind of remove those barriers and provide more latitude, flexibility in terms of, you know, how we uh, make a credit decision, you know, the, the things that, that we're able to kind of look past or, or really kind of um, dig deeper into, you know, um, your business um, and, you know, um, your ability to pay back a loan. So I think that's that's still a big issue um, with kind of traditional lending. Um, there's some things that, you know, we're trying to do to, um, you know, uh, move the needle a little bit uh, with that and kind of get away from this kind of asset-based lending um, that uh, most entrepreneurs have to deal with. Um, so we've come out with a new product um, that's really based on the future revenues of your business. So we're not really looking at historical revenues. We're not um, necessarily looking for you to give a personal guarantee. We're really kind of making a decision about the future potential of your business. So um, I can talk that, about that a little bit later, but I um, want to hear from, from Jackie, and she can give you kind of a personal experience of her, her process of trying to access capital. Yeah, so I actually started at, right in the pandemic, about July 2020. And um, I had a business plan. I was ready. You know, my business plan I felt was perfect. And um, but you know, I'm first generation Vietnamese American, so I was raised by a, a single mom. I was also an actor, so I had no assets to my name. I had really terrible credit. 
because as an actor, if you're not familiar, it's not like the most stable income uh, out there. And, you know, I couldn't have a guarantor because my mom, you know, still low income and had to face a lot of barriers when she came over here from Vietnam. And with that, I'm also a woman and I'm also Asian woman. And um, it was really difficult to, to say the least, to try and gain capital. Like no one, especially during the pandemic, right? Where like people were trying to save businesses and not necessarily support ones that were starting. Um, so it was nearly impossible for me because, you know, I had nothing to my name. I couldn't, I hadn't even sold a cup of coffee yet. And so I ended up funding the first half of my business, which was the mobile cart, um, doing a Kickstarter where I would, you know, try and sell people like stickers and cups and then go around and sell coffee. And I raised about $13,000 doing that. And, but then in order to raise money for my brick and mortar, I tried again. And even after I had sold coffee, was still denied access to capital. And it was due to my credit. It was due to the fact that I still had no assets, really. I did not have a car. I didn't really have anything. And so I felt really stuck. I didn't really even know where to go, um, what to do, like as many resources that I would go to, like AltCap and Casey Sourcelink. It was still like, uh, no matter where I would go to, it's like, a, a, no, you, you don't really qualify. Um, so I ended up bootstrapping the entire thing. I raised about $95,000 on my own. <laughs> um, mainly, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, it was not easy, but, um, you know, I entered every grant contest that I could, every pitch contest that I could. I um, did a lot of GoFundMe where we would collaborate with a lot of other small businesses and I would, any opportunity such like this one where I got to tell my story was some, another opportunity for someone to buy a cup of coffee at a pop-up or maybe donate to my GoFundMe or tell me about an opportunity that I had not known of. Um, and I even door knocked. Like I printed out flyers and I walked around different neighborhoods and I would knock on their doors, like old school style, knocking on their door, being like, this is my coffee shop. Please support us. Here's a link to my GoFundMe if you believe in, you know, what we want to do for the Asian community. But that's a hustle that you have to do every single day, nonstop. Um, and it was really discouraging because I saw all these other coffee shops open in a span of three, six months. And I'm over here still knocking on doors and not even being able to like access a loan to even start my business. And so um, it, it, and it did feel really um, unequal. It felt like well, why are all these, you know, straight cis men starting these coffee shops and getting loans? And then I walk in the door as an Asian woman and I feel like I have zero opportunities, um, which is ironic because it's why I started this coffee shop in the first place is to create opportunities, but I'm not even able to create opportunities because they don't happen for me, myself. So that was probably the hardest part of my entire business was raising enough money to even start. So it was hard. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And I know, you know, I followed you a lot. And I think the one thing that you definitely have is that social capital. So that was really great. And I think one of the things too, and we talked about this yesterday, uh, Jackie, is that I think a lot of business owners are really good at asking for money. Not all of us are successful in it, but we do see a lot of the wealthier folks and folks that are connected be able to do that behind the scenes. They are able to go to the bank and get that loan. And one of the things that I think that was really great that, that I appreciated uh, about you a lot is that you put yourself out there where a lot of entrepreneurs and people, especially folks with a lot of pride, would not publicly put themselves out there because you have other people that view that as just somebody asking for a handout. So can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it, I still to this day get a lot of people who are very judgmental and saying, well, why don't you get a loan? Or, you know, not everyone can just ask for money. And and it's funny because it's like, well, I am was not born into an, into an equal playing field. And I could, I tried that 
I did try that and it didn't work for me. So I'm going a different route. And I want to also um, do a very different way of starting a business where I don't start with debt because this is truly my only way to break, you know, the, the poverty within my family. And if I want to create generational wealth, I need to start off at least at an even point. And I just had to kind of, you know, take all the criticism and, and brush it off because a lot of people were like, well, you're just asking for donations. And where's your, where, where are the receipts for that? Where, all these people are donating. I was like, well, they believe in my cause. They believe in what I want to do for the community. And I had to stop caring about what people were saying because those were the type of people that they could go and walk into a bank and they could get that and they've never walked in my shoes before. So they wouldn't under, understand what that process was even like. Um, yeah, I'm still, I still do get messages about how, how dare I try to, you know, start a business, crowdfunding, or, you know, it, I've gotten a lot of criticism, but um, I am happy that my community that has supported me can walk through the doors and feel proud that they helped open my shop with me because I created this for the community. And so it feels like every brick, every, you know, stroke of paint was through them too. Every single penny was, you know, poured into that. Um, yeah, so it, it, it is very difficult, but as an entrepreneur, you have to have really thick skin too. And so I just brushed it off and was like, well, whatever. Like, hopefully you can come into my shop and, you know, <laughs> figure it out for yourself. But um, the point is it was very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. And then we'll get back to a little bit about the access to capital. Ruben's got some good things to share a little bit later. But India, want to talk a little bit about you. And I really enjoyed working with you. And I feel like I'm learning a lot of stuff about you, too, I think. I just found out yesterday you used to work at the Coffin Foundation. Is that correct? Correct. <laughs> um, so, so India, I think you could talk really well about um, another piece that was mentioned in, in Kaufman's plan, and it's that barrier that many of us have in starting a business when we so, have so much comfort in where we're at right now. And not the sense of, you know, I'm earning a paycheck, but more than anything, the benefits that 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 work life provides, right? And that's something that a lot of times gets overlooked when people decide to quit their jobs and jump into entrepreneurship and have to take that period of time without those those benefits, right? So can you talk a little bit about that experience and what you dealt with and how you navigated that? Um, I think Jackie, you said it best yesterday. When you jump into entrepreneurship, it's not just a career change, it's a whole lifestyle change. Like your world is turned upside down. And it's, you know, there's of course a lot of risks, great rewards associated with it too. But to your point, I went from a nine to five, shut down the laptop, go about my day to working around the clock, right? Um, and my job, my ownership, consuming my time. Now, I enjoy it, luckily, so it doesn't feel burdensome, but that was a significant shift in how am I spending my time. Um, great sacrifices with my husband, with my child as well. Um, so when I'm at the store working on the weekends, mind you, I never really had a job before or career where I had significant weekend work. I was used to Monday through Friday. That's not my life anymore. So my husband assuming those parental responsibilities. And then the scary part, too, is now having to solely rely on his income in starting a business, solely relying upon his health insurance, things that are, again, God forbid something happened to him, we're going to be up the creek, right, until uh, things, you know, progress with the business and grow and scale. So I think that speaks a lot to just, one, our healthcare system and retirement systems and a lot of other systems that really don't favor entrepreneurs. Um, and I'm so grateful to have that support system through my husband. But yes, it's a completely different lifestyle change. If you're open to the risk, um, if you have support, I would say that's probably just been my biggest um, motivation. Like, I have the support. I have the village. I have the people. If you're walking this journey alone, it makes it 
10 times more difficult. Not to say that I don't have my own challenges still, but uh, if you're in the position where you're making that change, you're considering entrepreneurship, make sure you have your people lined up, your safety nets, because your real safety net is like gone <laughs> when you're not, you know, employed by someone and when you're switching to self-employment. So not trying to be Debbie Downer, but this is just the reality of what it is. And I think having these conversations and making people aware ahead of time gives them the opportunity to say, yes, this is for for me, um, I love to say, do it scared, but do it anyway. Or if some people are like, no, this isn't. And i rather save more people. We talked about this. If you can make that decision to say no or never mind before you spent a lot of money, time, and resources. Great. And I uh, really appreciate you mentioning your husband stepping up and helping with the kids. Because one other thing that's mentioned is this gap in, in childcare, right? And I know we hear a lot about workforce development and being able to hold on to employees who need that access to, to childcare services. But what's really interesting about Kaufman's report is diving into entrepreneurship and how that lack of, of childcare support really keeps people from starting and growing their businesses. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, I would even just being practical, my husband, you know, had to work late tonight. So, hey, dad, can you pick up my son from daycare? Watch him for three hours. I'll go pick him up after the panel. So luckily I have that grandparent, family, babysitter support, but many people don't. So you miss out on those networking opportunities or the ability to start your business because you got little ones to take care of. So it's, it's very real. Um, and again, I think just a lot of societal structures uh, impede women, people of color, immigrants from moving forward in so many aspects. So if you can be a village for someone, help them out. Uh, I appreciate everybody who has helped me out along this journey do so. It, it means so much to entrepreneurs. Great. Um, so one of the things I think that really has been important to me in my career is especially working with low to moderate income entrepreneurs and a lot of folks that not only don't have access to, to funding, but don't have access to a lot of networks, right? And when we think about entrepreneurship, small business, any business, right, whether we're running it for somebody or running it for ourselves, every decision we make is a risk and a financial risk. But when you talk about somebody who has limited resources, then those risks mean so much more. And I've told Sam before, you know, one of the things that I really did well working with Casey Bizker early on is getting in front of people who said, hey, I need to start my business two weeks ago because I've already into this lease agreement in this space and I can't get my business started. So Casey Bizcare does a lot of that work and helping to alleviate that. But Sam, can you just share a little bit more around that space and what you all are doing as a local government to really help mitigate that risk, especially for the more vulnerable populations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I always start my phone calls with folks who are in that particular situation. Hey, I should have started my business X weeks ago or years. Um, that we're not a regulatory office. We're, I mean, we're an office of technical assistance. So what I heard you say was that you want to start your business. Um, and we're very fortunate that our city right, uh, supports that, that the city of Kansas City is entrepreneurial friendly, that our council supports it, that our mayor supports it, that our city manager supports it. Because we are one of two cities in the United States who offer technical assistance for entrepreneurs, and we're the only city in the United States who offers it at the capacity that we do. Um, so Kansas City is a really special place, and we're really grateful to have such supportive city hall um, to where we don't say, oh, you should have started two years ago. Here's all your fines. Here's all your penalties. Then come talk to us. Um, so that's been something that I've been very proud of, of Kansas City. Um, and then something that we're doing proactively um, we actually are um, the recipients of Kaufman funding. We're very grateful for the Kaufman Foundation um, to launch, and it's it's sort of hush hush for now, but um, but I trust y'all. Um, <laughs> but but it'll be formalized next month. Um, we're going to start inclusive entrepreneurship research. So we're going to have a, a really good idea of what it takes to be an entrepreneur in Kansas City, um, and, and that's going to help us implement programs, implement 
you know, different really specified tracks. So if you want to go from having a mobile food permit establishment health permit to a food establishment permit application, right, this very particular track, then you know exactly what's expected, you know how much it's going to cost, you know how long it's going to take you, and we can assist you throughout that process. And to be honest, a lot of the Kansas City Municipal Code, while it governs us, wasn't updated very recently, right? And, and I'm, I'm sure that's not a surprise, but there are some code sections. There was actually one, and I was in a meeting today, and it said most recently revised in 1976. So that code section isn't going to really help us know how to regulate a selfie state, right? Because that word didn't exist in 1976. <laughs> So I think it's one, being grateful for what we have in place, right? That, that even though it is an institution, even though it is a system, Kansas City really is entrepreneurial friendly and it has a lot of room to get better. Um, and I think that starts as far as a, an entrepreneur or a citizen and like me, myself, I live in the fifth district of Kansas City, 85th and Wayne. Um, you get to know your council person, like get to know the people who represent you in city hall to say like, look, I want to open up a business on this side of truce, or I want to open up a business in this council district, and there's not that much opportunity um, because that's exactly what they're there for. Um, so, so as a right organization, as an entity of City Hall, we're very grateful to have that flexibility and to be able to offer support, um, but also as citizens of Kansas City, as residents, um, we're even more grateful to, to be in touch with our elected leaders to, to be able to just voice our concerns and say, look, this is what we want Kansas City to look like and, and, and empower those folks who are honestly in that place to do that, to, to make that change as well. Yeah, so, so that's good. So there's a point that I want to mention um, to that that kind of ties into to, to Ruben's recent trip to Detroit. But before that, uh, Jackie, India, do you have anything to share? Because you both are in brick and mortar spots right now. And I know, Jackie, it took you a little while because you had to raise that capital. India, you're over in Zona Rosa, which I think is really great because a lot of people do overlook the Northland, right, when we talk about KC businesses. But can you talk a little bit about your experiences in going into that space and navigating the regulatory processes? And I know you went from food truck to, to brick and mortar. So could you all share a little bit more about that? I'll share a little bit. Um, my process was very, very difficult. Again, um, it felt a little unequal, I want to say, um, because there, again, there were other shops in town that were opening quite qu quickly, passing their health inspections. Um, and it would take me months to even get a uh, I would have to go to the health department. I would have to go to city hall. I would have to be the one, like no one was answering my emails or they would say it would be forwarded to another person and then another person. And there were times where I'd be so lost with the steps of what to do next. Um, Cause you know, I, I just Googled like what to do after this. And it's according to a certain city, according to a certain county, according, you know, and I felt really lost until actually Sam stepped in and helped. But even me, I, I joined the Parks and Rec board. I have a pretty large social network of like followers on social media. I'm very involved with, a, you know, I'm tenacious. I like go and do these events and stuff. And I still had a, a nightmare trying to get to through some like red tape of fixing my ceiling and then uh, one person would inspect it and another person would come in and say, oh, that doesn't pass. And another person would come in and inspect it. That doesn't pass. And it, it was really difficult to a point where I, I um, texted Quentin myself and, and I was like, excuse me, I need help. And I don't know what else to do. And I, I'm over here texting the mayor, like trying to get some resources and some input and and it shouldn't be that hard it should not be that difficult for someone who just wants to pursue something and and I already had access to the capital and I already had a social following and it still was so difficult and I think because there's still so much room to grow there's still a lot of higher ups that you know and COVID I, I definitely understand that there was a huge influx of, you know, unemployment and staff changes. And so, um, but it, it still was really 
discouraging because there were people that didn't look like me that were opening their businesses just fine. And then I'm here with um, other female women of color that are opening food businesses and we're all literally texting each other in the same group wondering why we aren't passing our health inspections and why is it taking three, four, five more times, but then these other people pass with flying colors. And so um, it was really hard to, every process of my business was very difficult and I didn't want to question if it was because of who I was, but at the end of the day, it, it kind of felt a little bit like that. I um, had the privilege of being introduced to the BizCare office maybe three months after I opened my business and I was just amazed, um, amazing team led by Nia Richardson. And she came in, um, I was actually sitting in a Porterhouse KC, I was in their curriculum program, Nia came in, had never heard of the BizCare office. She ran those lists down. You need to do this, this, here, there. Here's the resource. Here's the link. Give us a call. I set up a meeting. And I was just amazed. Um, many of the things on the list I did check off prior to starting, so I was grateful for that. But it was still like for people who have no idea where to start, here's this hidden gem that is now available, accessible, mobile-friendly, all the things. Um, so it was a confirmation for me, like, okay, maybe I am doing things right. Um, and also for some of the checklist items that I hadn't thought of, um, it gave me the opportunity to go back, amend, fix, get things going. Um, so I'm very much so grateful, but speaking to like networks, had I not been in the Porterhouse KC program, had I not heard from Nia, I probably still would be clueless. Um, and I consider myself to be a smart person. Um, and to Jackie's point, you know, we're knowledgeable, we're tenacious, and there's still things we don't know. So I'm forever grateful for their office um, because it, again, gave me that confidence like, I've done it right, and that was important for me because a lot of people start businesses, but they ain't valid, they not legit, and uh, oftentimes it's just ignorance, right? You, you don't know what you don't know. So as much as we can share this information, get it in front of people, make it accessible, I think our entrepreneurial economy and network here in Kansas City will be that much stronger. Great, really appreciate that. And I think what's really interesting about where you all are located, and I think any business that's brick and mortar, is that when you look at any business that's within a space, you know, kind of putting my neighborhood community development hat on, in a lot of ways, you're deterring blight in that community, right? So what we see around Kansas City is a lot of once vacant spaces. And I remember, Sam, talking to, to, to your staff even earlier and working with businesses and saying, that space has been vacant for so long and we're trying to get this business in there to, 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 to battle blight in our neighborhoods. So when we talk about the neighborhood aspect of it, Ruben, I know you came just recently from your exchange in Detroit and there's a lot of work over there around equitable neighborhood development, but also really focusing in on entrepreneurship and small business and building back those communities in an inclusive and, and equitable way. Can you share a little bit about that experience and how you're also seeing that here in Kansas City? Yeah, and I'll um, just piggyback real quick off of some of the things that I've, I heard. Because um, before we have a conversation about capital with a small business, we really have a conversation about the other resources that that entrepreneur has access or has has um, has accessed to prepare them to become a, a small business owner, and it's really you know, the KC source links of the, uh, of, you know, the uh, Prospect Business Association, Small Business Development Center, Women's Business Center, um, Dan Smith's uh, shop, uh, Porterhouse. Yeah, I mean, being prepared to be a small business owner, I think it is, is a lot more than people really think. And we saw this, especially during COVID. We were actually a PPP lender. So um, you know, yes, we acknowledge, recognize that there are disparities in lending, um, you know, with certain um, populations, especially um, entrepreneurs of color. But even within entrepreneurs of color, there are disparities in lending. And, you know, there are plenty of 
black and brown owned businesses that did receive a PPP loan, but there are also ones that didn't. You know, why is that? That to us is the, 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 the problem that we're trying to solve because um, yes, access is not universal, but uh, for us, we're trying to figure out why access to capital is not, um, you know, still is a hurdle or a challenge for, for certain small businesses. And what we learned, especially during COVID and being a PPP lender, is those entrepreneurs or small businesses that did not invest in, you know, um, their, their back office, accounting system, you know, really kind of understanding the cash flow of their businesses. They're the ones that really have the biggest challenges accessing capital. And I think that's, that is not just for PPP, but for any, you know, any opportunity that you're looking to access capital. And, um, you know, I applaud Jackie for, you know, looking at under every rock, trying to access every, any form of capital she could. But at some point, you know, you're going to need to, to, to get a loan. And, you know, what you've done so far and the, um, the time that you spent to really build your business uh, I think is gonna is gonna benefit you when when you do come to Altcap for a micro loan, so we can take you to the next level. Um, yeah, but um, you know, as far as Detroit, yeah, I shared with the group that um, I was part of a chamber leadership exchange. Um, they they make an annual trip to another city every year, and this year we went to Detroit uh, to learn about what they were doing up there. And what I was really impressed by in Detroit, um, and keep in mind, like it's not kind of an apples to apples comparison, Detroit and Kansas City. Um, actually, the black population in Detroit is 518,000, so uh, that's more than the population of Kansas City, Missouri. So everybody's really impressed at how many black-owned businesses exist in Detroit, um, but you got to keep in mind that, you know, the population is just nothing like Kansas City. That said, they do a very good job of helping to create businesses, especially, um, you know, within, the, uh, within communities of color and entrepreneurs of color. That's something I think we still have a, a problem. Um, a, a significant challenge here in Kansas City. Um, I looked up some statistics about like how many minority-owned businesses are in the KC Metro. Um, can anybody just guess, take a quick guess of what you think? Yeah, in the Metro, right? Yeah, so my, my, my number was a little bit smaller because I was looking at dated, dated statistics. 9,000, um, there's about 55,000 in, in Detroit. Um, and you know, 9,000 is formal businesses, it's like, you know, registered businesses. There's a whole lot of informal businesses out there. Um, but we need to do a, better, do a better job of creating more businesses in, in these communities. Um, we need to do a better job of formalizing more businesses because that's where we're truly going to be able to kind of realize this inclusive economy where you've got opportunities for, uh, to diversify your supply chain and kind of uh, create more opportunities, more jobs in, in, in communities that don't have, don't have these opportunities. So, that was a big takeaway, but I think the way that they've done that, and this is not kind of a self-interested promotion of CD, CDFIs, they really centered community development financial institutions in all of their community revitalization and economic development efforts, because they recognize that CDFIs um, truly have this, this focus and this mission and purpose um, to deliver cap, uh, capital into communities to entrepreneurs that, that fall out of the financial mainstream. And yes, Detroit kind of hit rock bottom. Um, so, you know, there was really no other way to go but up. Um, but I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned in terms of the infrastructure that they put in place using CDFIs, making capital more accessible, um, really kind of leaning on these alternative sources of capital, whether it's private, public, philanthropy, um, to really um, stimulate investment in communities to help create more small businesses. And you know they're slowly seeing the revitalization of, of you know neighborhoods because of the small businesses that that are, are being created there and, and, and sustaining and thriving. And a lot of times the businesses that are there today are anchoring those neighborhoods, right? And I will do a, a quick Kaufman plug and UMKC plug. We're part of UMKC. Um, Center for Neighborhoods is doing some really good research as a Kaufman grantee and really looking at the informal business sector and black and brown owned businesses in black and brown communities also and really just getting a better understanding of that space and the potential for uh, really providing some more more support in that space. Going back, as you mentioned, Detroit is 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 really uh, you know inclusive in how it, it helps to support those small businesses. Sam, looking at the government, you guys have done a lot and that's really nice. 
Um, you know, the city, of course, addresses a lot of policy changes to make it easier to start and grow business. At the same time, there's that public health, uh, you know, piece that's important, right? Um, but can you share a little bit more about the process and what that looks like from your seat and what you all are doing to make those types of things easier? Because we don't see a lot of businesses in our neighborhoods. We see a lot of commercial districts, but not businesses kind of pocketed in between the homes like we do in other cities. So what are you all doing to kind of make it more accessible for folks to start businesses in all ways? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I know I, the analogy that I provided at the very beginning, right, of repaving the street is a new focus of ours, right? Because historically our office has been a staff of two, maybe three, and, and really, frankly, that's just technical assistance and admin and catching up on the emails. That's about all you have time for. So just recently with some new capacity, um, and we actually moved into the neighborhoods division. So we're under the Department of Neighborhoods um, in City Hall. So the adage of, you know, you put your money where your mouth is or you vote with your money. The city of Kansas City recognizes small business, recognizes entrepreneurship as neighborhood centric because that's how it's funded in City Hall. Um, but something that we've done this year or a few things that we've done this year for policy. Um, one, there's a business in particular trying to open on Armour and Gillum where they serve books uh, or where they serve wine, and it's a bookstore, Bliss Books and Wine, soon to open, right? Um, they couldn't apply for a liquor license. Not that they tried and they were denied. Not that they, you know, filled it out but didn't fill it out right. They couldn't because there was some 1976, something or another, right, that said per 100,000 residents, this many liquor licenses can exist. And when you draw the line of residences in, I guess that's like Longfellow meets Union Hill meets Paseo, right? Like, Part of that is Westport. Part of that is Broadway. So they have all these bars that aren't really in their neighborhood that are preventing them from even submitting an application. Um, so we were able to go to council um, and pass an ordinance that removed that requirement. So it allows them to apply. It didn't just say, hey, give a liquor license to anybody who got a beaten heart, because we don't really want that in our neighborhoods. But it allows them to apply. Um, so that's really been a focus, and that's that's a hallmark of, you know, that, that's something that we were really proud of because that's been something that we've created. Okay, like through the health department, if you have, right, a pop-up pizza shop that's one of the best in the city, right? That is going to be a really difficult health permit to get because that is a newer business model, and that hasn't existed institutionally. So how can we ensure that the health department does their due diligence and that we can feel safe, which and you don't even feel safe. It's like an out-of-body experience when you have to buy our pizza. But how can we ensure that we're, right, we're still compliant, but that we make the process attainable, that we make it accessible? And I think at a, a local level, it's through that policy. It's through, okay, like, what are we requiring them to do and why? And how can it be mutually beneficial? How can it still satisfy our duty as the city, right, to protect our residents and, and to promote wealth? but also to protect our business owners and to promote wealth. Like, you know, as a city, it's like, that's what we're all about, but sometimes we forget about the entrepreneurs. Um, so I think that's been a focus of ours of how we make that better. Um, and then additionally, like, uh, like I had mentioned with, um, with our research coming up, we also um, made a commitment to the National League of Cities for the following year to identify three to five institutional barriers facing Hispanic business owners and implement two to two to five or whatever, the same amount of institutional changes. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so that's gonna be our focus next year too, is taking a long, right, hard look at what are some institutional historic challenges that have fo faced Hispanic business owners and what are some things that we can change. Because even though I'm bilingual and even though I can read, write, and speak English and Spanish, there are a lot of things at the city that I can't read or that I still don't understand. And I've been working there. And, I, right, and it's just not in language that's approachable. Um, so I think that's where we really loop together, not only as City Hall itself and our you know, communications department and our, and our great team that we have to all link arms and, and do good, but it's also where we get the citizens, the neighborhoods, in fact, involved as, as a, you know, the, the sum of us together is greater than us individually. Great. And I think maybe to add on a little bit, and we've been talking a lot about access to knowledge and the different programs that exist to not only help support folks who want to start and grow businesses, but also folks who support businesses. So Sam, can you talk a little bit about the programming that you all are 
planning to implement. And then I'd like to also hear from Jackie and in, in India about some of the programming that they really have taken advantage of that gave them that knowledge and that information to, to really move into where they're at today. Yeah, absolutely. So I know we're big fans of Casey Sourcelink, of course, right? Because it's one of the few organizations that exists to educate you of what exists. Because right now, I actually spoke with somebody yesterday who, who Googled, how do I start a business in Kansas City, Missouri? And they were quoted $1,500 to get the same paperwork that we can get them in an hour for free. So I think that's like the, the big, right? That, that's like the, the bell ringing of, hey, like something needs to be done because if we just entrust, entrust, right? If we just let folks go to Google, then somebody in Delaware with a registered corporation over there is going to make $1,500 off of a service that's offered here. So, so part of that um, survey work, part of that, um, what we're building out for next year in that programming is, is creating like a hub and spoke model so the entrepreneur is at the hub of this wheel, but there are 19, 20, and honestly, in both of your experiences, probably 1,900 or 2,000 different things that you have to do each day. But for the regulatory requirements, go to KC BizCare, right, for funding. Even if you don't get a microloan, even just to understand funding better, go to AllCab. So you, right, so you at least understand in Kansas City, what does this ecosystem look like? How do I fit in? How do I not spend $1,500 if something's for free? Or how do I get a loan at 6% instead of 16%, right? So I, I think that's going to be a big piece of the picture is education, is letting people know what exists um, because, you know, access, accessibility, equity, all of those are really great buzzwords. But what it really comes down to is education. Like, are, are people aware? Are, are people aware of what's in their neighborhood? Because I know I like to walk to get a a cup of coffee because it means I'm keeping my tax dollars in my zip code. It means I'm supporting local. But if I didn't know that that coffee shop was down that road, I might drive to another one. Um, so the same thing, right, to be said is if you don't know what's in your neighborhood, if you don't know what Kansas City is offering, what's in that entrepreneurial ecosystem, then, then how can we expect folks to take advantage of it? Yeah, I would say I'm a big proponent of doing all the things, literally taking advantage of every opportunity. I think Jackie shares that same sentiment. Um, for me, when I had my business idea, I knew I needed to start right, have a solid foundation. One of the first programs I was introduced to was actually the Kaufman Fast Track program. And it's crazy because even working here, I didn't even realize that was a thing. Um, but I did that 12-week course through Entrepreneur Business Basics, uh, owned and operated by Kira Cherie. That was a 12-week online virtual program. By the conclusion, I I had my business plan. I felt really confident about starting. After that, I hit up the SVDC. So I did a program with them for maybe about a month uh, with Rebecca Goobles and, oh man, Joel Barrett. Maybe some of you all know those fine individuals down the street. So that was another opportunity for me to learn and learn quickly. Shortly after that, I got connected with the Porter House KC and joined that community. Then on from there was KC Source League, Global Entrepreneurship Week, all cap, closing the deal pitch competition. So everything just kind of uh, continued and I'm a big proponent of like learning never stops. You never have all the right answers. There's always room to grow. So pursuing those opportunities was important. But for some of your average regular Joe on the street, they may not know what Global Entrepreneurship Week is, KC Source Link. So that's why I try to champion and connect as many people as possible to these amazing resources here in Kansas City because they're there, they're great. Um, and I'm sure there's a million more that I can, I, I think about pipeline. Um, yeah, there's a ton is all of that I'm trying to say. And I encourage every entrepreneur, plug in how you can, when you can, um, do all the things, um, because I was able to learn so much from each of those programs, entities um, that I'm very much grateful for. Um, if it's free, sign me up. So I... <laughs> I used every single resource that you can think of, but how I first started was I, I love social media and I joined an amazing Facebook group called Innovate Her, which um, I wanna thank so much. It was a, a Facebook group just for women entrepreneurs, women like-minded individuals, and they suggested 
Casey Sourcelink, which then led me to the public library, which then led me to their Square One program, uh, which they do food truck classes for free. And so I learned a lot about um, what to do about my mobile cart through that. And then I, you know, they then suggested alt cap, which then suggested doing a pitch competition, which I entered and won. Hey. And um, yeah, and all those things just kind of trickled down. But again, it was up to me to look for those things. It was up to me to Google them, to actually go to the library, to actually go into these offices, to actually ask questions and not be afraid to do that. So I think um, as an entrepreneur, you kind of have to switch gears and to kind of treasure hunt. Um, I also love mentors. And um, there's a huge resource called SCORE, which um, you can get a free mentor um, anywhere in the country about any topic, anything. And I, my mentor was amazing. She um, had a lot of experience in marketing and she was retired. And a lot of these mentors are just want to help. And so I got a, a mentor through SCORE. It was free. I met with her twice a month. She looked over my business plan. She edited it. She like told me what banks to go to, what banks not to go to. Um, they all rejected me anyway, but never mind about that. But um, there are so many resources, but it, it is truly up to the individual to, to utilize them, um, to look them up, to really, you know, I'm part of Porterhouse. I, I've They've given me many opportunities, and sometimes you just have to check your emails. You have to sift through the noise to kind of look for opportunities such as, you know, I didn't even know about Entrepreneurship Week until someone had reached out to me and wanted me to be part of it. And I was like, whoa, I can't believe that this is available. And so hopefully, you know, if I share something on my social network on Instagram or, you know, if India, you do yours we're then expanding it to all of our friends. And then just a simple social share. You know, a lot of these entrepreneurs are a lot younger now. They're trying to create their own path. And what do they use is social media. And that is their main source of news now too, you know. And so uh, that's definitely something that I try to be really engaging with, with my community. Um, because that's what they use and that's what I use and that's how we find out information now. So Great, appreciate it. And I think one of the things too, you pointed out Kaufman Fast Track, which I think there's a relaunch or been a, an upgrade to the Kaufman Fast Track program. And I will say one of the advantages that that program has is that not only is it providing that knowledge to entrepreneurs, but in the case of Kira with EBB, it provides opportunities for somebody to use that model to then run their business, which has been really great to see. Now, Ruben, last question before we open it up to, to the audience, but I feel like Ruben is in a really tough space when you talk about knowledge and knowing about AltCap and knowing about this type of financing that they provide. One of the things that, that we, of course, know about is folks who don't get that access to that financial funding from, from, from our typical banks or other places. Traditionally, and sometimes more often than not, than we would like to see, go to that payday lender. And they puts them into this, this, this spiral of, of debt to have to continue to pay off just to continue with that dream or that aspiration of starting their business. And I really appreciate a lot of what CDFIs and what AltCap does because not only are they non-traditional lenders, but in a lot of ways they're saving people from those predatory lenders. So Ruben, can you talk a little bit about that? And then also maybe share a little bit more about some of the gaps that also still exist in providing that alternative capital people who really need that funding at the right time. Yeah, so we're, we're never gonna be the fastest lender. I mean, we're not going to be able to get you a loan in 48 hours or 24 hours like, you know, an online lender or kind of fintech will. But um, what we've seen is a lot of entrepreneurs get that loan and end up being, you know, in a, putting themselves in a very difficult situation to, to kind of pay back that loan, um, uh, mostly because of how those loans are structured. I mean, typically, um, you know, like if you're getting a loan from Square, um, they're pulling money from your account every day to pay back that loan. And that really, you really have to be on top of your, your kind of cash flow management to really manage that loan. So we, we do a lot of refinancing people out of these, these types of loans. 
I'm not saying they're all bad, but um, you know, certainly the the hard money lenders, the predatory lenders, you know, we, we want to help people avoid using those, or even your credit card. I mean, yeah, a credit card may may help you in a pinch, but um, there are other alternatives uh, like getting a micro loan or a small business loan from from a, a CDFI or even a credit union or a community bank. So um, uh, for us, yeah, fintech. There are fintechs out there that I think are, are filling a gap and, and can be very um, useful and beneficial to small businesses, but um, you just gotta uh, read the fine details in terms of you know what what that what that the terms of those loans uh, um, mean to, to you and your business. So I would say in terms of like what's left for us, you know, out there in terms of you know filling still filling those gaps that exist. I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier: is this revenue-based financing? We think this is kind of going to be a game changer for a lot of small businesses out there that, uh, again, have challenges accessing what I called asset-based lending. And, you know, asset-based lending is kind of the traditional form of a bank loan where, you know, a bank will lend you $10,000. Um, they're gonna look for some sort of collateral to secure that loan. So in the event that you default on the loan, uh, they can take your home or your car or whatever um, to try to recoup, um, recoup that loan that they made to you. Um, that's something that we're, we're looking to to provide an alternative to with, with revenue-based financing. So instead of you know, making that $10,000 loan to you, you know, securing the loan with, with a, a personal business asset of yours, and then you, know, you have to pay principal and interest um, to pay back that loan for, let's say, five years, we're gonna make you that th same $10,000 loan, but instead of paying principal and interest, we're gonna take a small percentage of your, of your revenue every month. So this, we feel, really synchronizes with the cash flow of the business it's also a very patient, uh, much more accessible loan because we're not asking for personal guarantees. Uh, we're looking at um, collateral only in specific um, instances, so it's really kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, but um, we feel that um, a revenue-based loan is a much more accessible loan, especially if you're a startup, especially if you're a se you have a seasonal business where you know, your revenues kind of go up and down, um, and we're gonna give you enough time, we feel, uh, for you to pay back that loan uh, and not um, hinder the ability of your company to kind of grow. Um, so we're excited to launch this, this type of product. We actually received uh, a very generous, um, what's called program-related investment from Coffin Foundation to do this. They're willing to kind of invest in, in AltCap to experiment with this type of a loan product. Um, so we're excited to kind of bring this to, to Kansas City um, here um, next year. Um, so yeah, if anybody's interested in, in learning more about that, please contact me or uh, talk to me afterwards or, or, or go to our website later this year. We'll have some information about that. Uh, but that's, that's kind of a, what we're trying to do to, again, make capital more accessible, um, really kind of fill those gaps uh, for small businesses that fall out of the financial mainstream. Mr. Carmona, if you want to uh, lead yeah. us in some closing uh, last takeaways. Yeah, so I think one of the things, and 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 really would have been nice to talk about a lot of other pieces, um, but there's a lot of talk in the plan about youth entrepreneurship and really getting a lot of our kids ready for it. We have one kid right here today learning about entrepreneurship, so that's really cool. Give him a round of applause, <laughs> y'all. <yo. laughs> uh, <laughs> We also, we, there's also a lot of talk about immigrants and access to entrepreneur for entrepreneurship for them and, and being able to attain citizenship through different types of entrepreneurship and also just simply looking at access to, to resources in their language that's limiting a lot of our immigrants from starting and growing their own businesses. So it's really interesting. So what was really cool about today is that of course, we all know that there's a lot of inequity out there, and it's these systems that have been put in place that put so many of us behind. The last two years has really put a lot of light for folks and really better understanding a lot of that inequity. And we have so many groups that the best way they can have, have done what they can to really try to put people on, a, on an equal playing field. But there's so much more that's left to do. And one of the things that I always refer to, especially right now, we're about two years after the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're about two years after the George Floyd incident and really this big push on social justice and really um, putting equity and equality in front of everything. And we're also at this point where, you know, things seem to be going okay and it's going to be easy to go back to the way things were 
and, and jump back into that space. And one of the things that I would challenge all of us here is to just remember that there's so much that's been done to certain communities that it's going to take a lot more work and intentionality to make sure that we are able to continue to put people on that equal playing field. So we have to continue to keep pushing for those things that we know are right. So really appreciate everybody for being here today. Appreciate the panel talking about a lot of their successes and their challenges. And uh, last plug, Global Entrepreneurship Week, November 14th to the 20th. We have a lot of folks here participating, but if you want to see a lot of different ways that entrepreneurship looks like throughout Kansas City, and especially if you're a corporation and how you can get involved in supporting entrepreneurs and small businesses, really come and, and join in with us. So appreciate you all today, and thank you.